Hi everyone, you are listening to the First Year Dakota podcast hosted by IEEFT, the show that decodes the first year experience by providing valuable insights and experience from current engineering students. I'm your host, Bernie Chow, a Track 1 AC222 and one of the logistics directors at IEEEFT, along with producer Akinori Kimura, who will explore various topics of academia and professional development to help you succeed in your first year of engineering. In today's episode, we did a full breakdown of the engineering science courses from first year so that you know exactly what you have gotten yourself into. Engineering science is known as a notoriously hard curriculum and you may have already heard some rumors about its intensity, but you can't get an actual full picture of first year engineering science without hearing from the students that have gone through the process. Today, we invited two wonderful guests, Catherine and Hannah to ask them about their experience and how they survived each course. Just by listening to this conversation, you will feel less anxious and more prepared. I would even recommend non eng size to listen to this episode, as I felt like I was learning a lot through our conversation. Hi guys, thanks for joining us today. It'll be great if one of you guys can start by introducing yourself. So Catherine, do you mind going first? Yep, for sure. So my name is Catherine, and I'm an ENGSCI 2T2. In September, I'm going to be going into my third year, and I'm planning to specialize in energy systems. And my name is Hannah. I'm also engineering science 2T2. I'm going to biomedical engineering this September. So I guess we can get right into the courses now. So the first group of courses we're going to be talking about is ESC 180, Intro to Computer Programming, and ESC 190, Computer Algorithms and Data Structures. So ESC 180 is the first coding course in EngSci, and it teaches you Python and C from scratch. But apparently for um, last year, they did only Python for this course. And for ESC 190, it is a second semester of first year. And this course focuses more on the theoretical concepts and taught a lot of different data structures for you guys, right? Mm. So I guess uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about like your slightly mentioned your coding background and how this course made you feel relative to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I'll go first. Um, So I had no background in coding before university whatsoever. I did not know what Python was before like September of first year. Um, so I think this course was slightly difficult for me in the very beginning. Um, although like the prof tried, you know, to like cater the course to beginners like me, it was still really difficult to, you know, do well in the labs because I thought they were pretty challenging and they had to use a variety of concepts that I wasn't really familiar with yet. Mm -hmm. So I thought this course had a very steep learning curve for a beginner like me. Yeah, so for me, I didn't have a ton of programming experience going into first year either. I probably did one or two, you know, modules online. But like, if you do those, I f- I'm sure like everyone is like curious in doodles. Like they don't really help you that much. So I wasn't like a real programmer either. So when I was going into first year, I actually had a lot of uh, trouble learning the course at first. And I think one of the reasons is because the way that I was learning it was wrong. So, Mm -hmm. for example, I was trying to memorize the syntax or I was trying to memorize, you know, different pieces and then fit them together. But then later on, like when I'm coding more frequently, I've learned that the thing that you should really notice is not like the syntax, but rather like the principles underneath it. So learn more about the um, kind of like the underlying principles and also um, thoughts on how things fit together as opposed to just the syntax itself because then the syntax is very small and like detail oriented and when you focus on that you lose sight of the bigger picture of what your program is supposed to do. Um, And the second thing is I think usually when you learn writing um, a new language it's like a different mindset right like the new language in terms of like even Chinese or Japanese or French everything has this different grammars and you have to adopt like adapt your mindset like have a different mindset in order to learn that new language because some words in one language doesn't translate to another language so then I feel like this is this kind of the same in coding which is the way I think about it wasn't like a computer it was more like a human <laughs> and then I would you know mm-hmm. make human mistakes because I didn't really think in that manner where you execute the code line by line so that would be something that 
I would say too, which is instead of focusing too much on the syntax at first, just train yourself to think differently. I think there's a course on, you know, MIT Open Courseware or like Harvard CSC 150 is like a, a beginner course that teaches you that way of thinking as opposed to the syntax right away. Because um, I think that is like actually the, the more difficult part. And then the, the faster you get that, the syntax is like whatever. So that would be my two cents. <laughs> Do these two courses focus more on like the syntax in the beginning or does it start off with like computational thinking and thinking of problems that way? I think definitely more syntax oriented um, as opposed to computational thinking, which which I think is one of the things that kind of put students who didn't have programming background at a disadvantage just because you have never like thought in that way before and now you're forced to think in a new way to do well the course. So that is like one of the things I think if you have free time in the evening or if you have some time before school starts, definitely start watching some videos um, and learn about that way of thinking. I like read Reddit posts. R slash programming apparently is a great source. Um, so do that before you actually learn the syntax at school. Yeah, and I feel like um, these two courses are kind of different in how they're structured, or at least in my year. Like ESC 180 was pretty syntax focused, like Hannah said. Um, but I found that ESC 190 was a lot more theoretical, especially towards the end. Mm. Um, like for my final, you know, I remember like drawing trees and everything. So it wasn't as much programming and coding, but rather it was more like you got to focus on the theory behind it, which I thought was really nice. And I really liked it. Mm hmm. So you mentioned that uh, you guys also have labs in this course, I would assume because it's like a co coding course. What were like some labs that kind of stood out to you that was like super hard or like super fun? And since they're two like very different stru different structured course, would you say like uh, labs in first semester were more fun or like second semester was more interesting? Um, I think personally for me, I like the labs better in second semester, just because like by that by that point, like I knew more of what I was doing rather than just like copy and pasting code, which wasn't really fun for me. But yeah, like one of my most memorable labs was probably the chess AI. And I think that I don't know if that goes for Hannah as well, but that was the one that definitely took the longest time. But I think it, you know, it opened my eyes to kind of what I could do with the knowledge I had, whereas before you know, I didn't really know what I could do with coding Python or C. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's the same for me too. And I think that's like a learning point for me because I think usually when you go to programming with a professor, you kind of depend on the professor to give you all the knowledge if you don't have any programming background before because it's intimidating to get into. Um, and I think that is like one of the barriers why I guess me, like I didn't do well in first year's programming, even though I'm working on my own startup with a software. So it's like, okay, weird. But I think one of the reasons why I didn't like programming at first was because the labs in first uh, semester, it was like infinity games or, you know, tic-tac-toe, which is like, okay, these are cool things, but they're very classical computer science problems and they don't really have any direct implications in the real world. So. I would say that if you want to kind of like ignite your interest in programming earlier on as opposed to like waiting until the chess AI to actually get your interest up, it's like looking at what are some easy games that you can make online because there are so many resources out there that kind of like mimics the principles that your teachers kind of like teach you in class. Um, and I feel like that is like so much more fun to do as opposed to just do whatever the professor says because I feel like if you're able to just enjoy it in the first place, then you can kind of carry that enjoyment into whatever the professor tells you to do, and then you automatically do well on it. So I think, like, don't depend on the professor too much, but think about, okay, what are some other resources um, in terms of fun programming games that don't take a lot of time online that I could do that would, you know, maximize my enjoyment, and then good marks come as a result of that. You know, so that is like the mindset I would suggest um, myself taking, just like giving myself advice when I got into first year, um, which is like take a more positive mindset towards it. Um, and then also realize that there are a ton of other people in engineering science that don't know programming. And <laughs> like one of the things that I observed is I have friends who are very, very good at programming. One of my friends had like 15 years of programming. Like he learned programming before he learned like how to write properly in English. So, so it was it was a very interesting friend. And then they're they're not 
they're, they're people with like three plus year experience in programming, you know? And then so you come into this class not knowing anyone, and I see a bunch of people who just type super fast on a computer, so loud, <laughs> and then it's intimidating, right? So like, so like I think that just understand that there are other people out there that don't know it, um, and then they are willing to help you collaborate with you. It's like a huge change in like my mindset because before I was just like, oh, everyone knows everything and I don't know anything. Uh, but then it's like that's not true. It's a it's a myth that you have to uh, debunk basically. Yeah, I guess it's always good to know that there's all like there's others like you out there. It makes you feel safer. And you mentioned that there's like lots of resource out there. So I just have a quick question, I guess. So I was asking some of my Enchai friends before this interview, and, and then they mentioned you guys have a channel called Discourse or something. Mm-hmm. I was just wondering what that is because I've never yeah. heard of it, and we I don't think we use it as well. Is it something similar to Piazza where it's like a question asking, answering anonymous? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's actually like um, basically exactly the same as Piazza. You can answer questions, and then props and other students can answer. So I thought that was a pretty good resource in first year because I don't know, like we had a lot of questions that required asking outside of office hours and lecture time. Okay, yeah, that's cool. I just want to put that out there. So like, there is a way to just message the prof and their TA or everyone else in the mm-hmm. course anonymously, so pe- like you can get help. Amazing. So I guess we can move on to the next group. So next group is ESC 194 Calculus 1 and ESC 195 Calculus 2. So ESC 191 teaches both differential and integral calculus, whereas ESC 195 is the sequel and focuses more on the differentiation integration techniques and also teaches you sequences, series, and partial derivatives. I guess calculus is a course where everyone kind of like learned in high school a little bit. So I was wondering how that helped you in your experience, whether you guys did some special programs in high school, whether that helped, and how does everyone else generally feel about this course? Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess I'll go first. Uh, I did math IB high level in high school in Alberta, and I participated in like a lot of like national math contests, so I was pretty into math in high school, um, and I really liked calculus as well. Um, I found that, you know, like definitely the concepts I learned in high school helped me even into second semester, which I wasn't expecting. I thought like I would burn out all my high school knowledge in first semester. But yeah, I think this was one of the few courses in second semester that I had learned about in high school. So yeah, I think the concepts for both courses are definitely like really manageable. And the course also follows the textbook pretty well. So I really like that. And I was able to read the textbook after lectures and everything. Um, But like one thing I did find with this course was understanding just the concepts didn't really directly translate into being able to like solve midterm and final problems, which is I think what you guys are, you know, interested in. Um, So I guess, yeah, we can go over some tips of how to prepare for finals. And I think that would probably help you guys a lot more than just, you know, going over the concept. Yeah. So for me, my background was, so I went to like BCI, which is a school in Toronto. Um, I did AP Calculus BC, but then it wasn't like a huge help for me personally. And I think it's because um, in first year calculus, uh, Professor Sanchby is a character. So he, I don't know if he's still teaching, but basically he teaches you a lot of proof. So there was like Delta Epsilon proofs and like just a bunch of like proofs in general. So. My tip for that, it, it's with the, it's like kind of weird because I also had a friend at the time who does mathematics and physics. So he also learned, you know, similar proofs, but he is in, you know, mathematics. So it's like more advanced. But then something I've learned is that they teach you proofs more properly in, in like mathematics and in engineering science. And then when I took Professor Sanchez course, I didn't really understand why we use certain, you know, like um, notations, etc. And then so I went to talk to my mathematics friend and then he was like, oh, it, actually, this is like the intuition behind it. So I think I think when people learn calculus, it's a lot of like pluck and chuck. And then basically you're trying to like see what the professor does and kind of mimic that in your own way in a new problem. But then I would say just trying to learn about like the intuition behind it um, and then maybe get a friend in math and then they can teach you the tuition for free. Yeah, Hannah, I feel like you're talking about me when you're like pluck and chuck. I literally just like went to the test and copied all the theorems and I was like, okay, I just need to memorize this to succeed on the final. Yeah, that was not the case. Yeah. 
that is re- that is very real though like that that is mm-hmm, a real thing yeah. that people do like i have friends in uh in in like like a lot of friends actually who were just like how do you even do this delta epsilon proof mm-hmm. what are some classical examples let's memorize the proof and then some people actually ended up doing pretty well um but like long term if you want to pursue like F- like um finance and mathematics in the i feel like it's good to have a math friend in first year and kind of like let them teach you the actual way you do the proof um, and then you'll you'll be able to do it uh, pretty easily from from there on. So I think um, also I think that math like sometimes you think that high school teaches you real math, but I don't think high school teaches you real math. It's it's more like okay, this is a function, um, derivative, da da da. I feel like university teaches you like at least first year in size very theoretical. The math is more real, not as real as mathematics as a major, but it's more real than high school. Um, and then. Okay, then you have to change your mindset as well because before you, you're used to like plucking and jugging, but now you have to learn, okay, the intuition behind it. Um, and it's like fun because, for example, when I first learned about calculus and then the torus, I was like, what the hell is the tor- torus? <laughs> and I, it's like, okay, it's a donut. Okay, that's so boring. What is the different interpretation of the torus? And I was like, oh, the human body is a torus because you have the mouth, you know, and then you have your butthole whatever <laughs> so it's like just changing, <laughs> changing that i was like wow you know i can actually see math in my daily life so that was a fun um but the like, calculus was one, one of my favorite courses for sure um but yeah building that intuition matters mm-hmm. so i also ask another group of friends <laughs> in Hench Sai. so <laughs> they were saying that sometimes they find it difficult to keep up with the pace so i was assuming that mm-hmm. you guys have like your, your calculus was really fast paced and you guys mentioned that it was like slightly proof heavy which is different from um the core a calc so i maybe like expand a little bit on that and maybe also some some learning strategies for the exam as Catherine mentioned earlier mm-hmm. um yeah so i think to keep up with the pace uh, what really helped was the weekly quizzes that we had every week i found that you know studying for those kind of forced me to keep up with the content so I feel like for me personally like that wasn't a huge issue and I feel like you know if you have that drive to do well in the quizzes you would probably keep up with the material too um yeah and like as for like the proof intensive part of the course I think that really showed itself during the assessments obviously like I'm not sure if you guys will have the same finals and midterms but yeah for me like that was a part that I really struggled with and how I improved on the proofs was I had to read a lot of like extra resources because I found there were a lot of like typeset proofs on the internet um, from other courses and from just like miscellaneous resources on the internet like the delta epsilon proofs I found youtube videos on them and I read up a bunch of you know examples on the internet and I found that really helped me study as opposed to just memorizing the theorems which I had done for the midterm and the result was not good so yeah I guess yes I uh-huh. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. I was sh- I was just like thinking that's pretty interesting, and yeah, proof is definitely something people struggle with and struggle to kind of like get a better strategy mm-hmm. at because sometimes it's very structured. Like there's a certain answer, and it's hard to kind of like find that answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Hannah, mm-hmm. go ahead. Yeah, so I think that's something that I wish I learned in um, calculus first year is learn how to do problems more quickly without getting sloppy. So, for example, I think um, when you do like problems or some problems or like this is me. So it's like I look at the problem. It's like, oh, this is so easy. Why do I waste time doing it? And then what happened was on the test or the exam, I, I was able to do like a slightly more difficult problem because I focus more on those when I practice them for the quizzes. But then the easy ones, I kind of flopped on, which is kind of dumb because it's like, okay, why shouldn't you be able to do both? So I think um, for the easy problems, don't don't just like skip over them. Just maybe do one or two, but then make sure that you have like a high accuracy rate when you practice at home. Because something I noticed is, for example, the first exam ever, I think the average was like 50 or 60. Mm-hmm. And it's like completely normal for people to have like 50, 60 averages in things like um, And then it's, it's like it's because people didn't mm-hmm. finish. Um, and literally, that it, it's because like one, you didn't practice enough, and two, it's like you just didn't do the easy problems fast enough. So I think by increasing just like the sheer speed of how you solve the problem could help. 
Um, and then something about me is that I actually enjoy and do more well on the proof part than the problem solving part. And I think it's because for the proof part, it's like you have like building blocks, so you just memorize all the theorems. So what I do is like when you learn, you can create like a mind a mind map, and then you have like the bottom, which is like the foundation. You can write out all the theorems and what they like, what they indicate, and how they relate to each other, and then just like derive from that base theorem. What is the the, like the next, you know, color, color. I can never pronounce the word. Like, like, like the next implication of that theorem, and what's the next implication of the theorem? So that, like, in math, you have theorems that you have, like, a bunch of other derivations that make it look like you have like a hundred theorems at once. But in 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 fact, you only have five, and then everything else is a derivation of that. So whenever I do proof um, on exams or tests, I always say, you know. Just look at theorem 3.7 in the textbook. It says this. I don't know. Um, and then basically it's like people would try to memorize, okay, what are the other theorems? But then those are just leaves on the tree, right? You want to go to the root. So just memorize the root theorems. And then you will always get like a lot of marks by memorizing the root theorems because it's the fundamental truth. Whereas if you memorize like, you know, the leaf theorem, then it's like, okay, what, where do you base that on? Um, and I think that's how... I learn proofs in general, which is like just think of it like a tree structure, and then where the problem fits in that tree. Mm, okay, that's really helpful because I definitely think that is true. Like even though we learn like minimal true like proofs, but yeah, it's always just based on another thing. So I guess we can move on to the next set of math courses. So ESC one. Uh, 03 Eng- ma- engineering mathematics and computation and MAT 185 linear algebra so ESC 103 teaches you the fundamental of linear algebra concepts such as matrices and vectors it also teaches you how to use MATLAB whereas MAT 1 85 is the actual linear algebra course for the first year end size so it centers around linear algebra proof so how did you guys find these two courses? And it's interesting that you guys used uh, like quite a bit of MATLAB, I think. That's what mm-hmm. I heard. Yeah, Hannah, mm-hmm. do you want to go first? Uh, sure. So I this is actually my favorite, favorite course. Uh, I, I like it even more than calculus. Um, and I think there are a couple of resources that I find really helpful. Um, and it's helpful because I think in class, I think Professor Kluwitz teaches it. He kind of teaches it a bit slowly, so he's the opposite of Professor Stanchby, I think. And he makes sure that everyone understands the concept. He's totally your father figure, you know, very kind and caring. Um, same with Professor Stanchby, but then he's like very fast. Um, and then I think one thing that helps me is that you can actually spend more time learning calculus and less time spending linear algebra because of that. Um, and I think there are a couple resources online that I find a lot really, really helpful. So before you enter the, the class, you should probably should look up Gilbert Trang. Everyone knows Gilbert Trang, I think. It's like he's the, he has this whole MIT course online on linear algebra. And the way he teaches this is really good. So he teaches you about, you know, the big picture. You know, what is the big picture? Right. And then he would say, what does, you know, calm space mean, row space mean, no space mean. And it's like he teaches you in a way that three years later, like you would still remember it because it's just like very intuitive. Um, So the first video you should watch is the big picture of linear algebra, where he will teach you all of that, but in very layman terms. Um, Also, you should watch it on 2x speed and not 1x speed because he's I'm pretty sure he's 80 and he speaks so slowly. so then you should watch it at like 2x or 2.5x speed. Um, and then it, it, each video is only 5-10 minutes, so it's like pretty, pretty pretty chill. If a video is 30 minutes, you spend you can spend half the time, which is 15 minutes, right? So in class, you will spend one hour learning this one concept. It's the same thing in his video, but then since you watch it at 2x speed, because the man speaks so slowly, you can watch three videos. So then you get ahead of the class. And then for the time that you get ahead of the class, you can spend studying calculus, which is more difficult because professors tend to be so fast. So that was what I did. So I remember there was a a time where the courses online were so good that I just didn't go to class. (laughs) And then um, and then basically I just spent my whole time studying for um, professors then to be at home. And then for the and then when I went back to class, 
um, I remember I answered a question, and the professor Clue was like, "Wow, that language is beautiful," or something. And I'm like, "Bro, I didn't go to class for three weeks." So I thought that was really interesting because then by learning from this course. You can actually like deter, like develop your own kind of like mathematical language or the way you say things that make you sound very intelligent, which is cool, but at the same time help you understand the materials better. So that is one. I'm just looking at online. Oh yes, also three blue, one brown. So three blue, one brown helps you visualize, uh, visualize math, and I really like it because before I wouldn't understand concepts like. You know, divergence in curl in calculus, but then he explained it in such a nice way um, that it makes makes it feel like great to learn. And also, he has a very soothing voice, so it's like okay, you're learning that, but also it's also like meditation because his voice is so soothing. So those are two resources that I would recommend for learning linear uh, linear algebra. Um, there are a couple textbooks I think they give you in second semester. I don't know if this is first year or second year, but um, the one, the one that looks kind of like Asian Egypt, you know, Catherine, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, the one written by um, Prof. Deleterio. Yeah, that one. I thought that one was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it had a story that like just took you from like I don't know. I think it made you like time travel or something to go back to like the medieval time and like learn out al- linear algebra through. I don't know. I forget what it was, but there was like a huge storyline. It's very interesting. I wish our textbooks were that fun. <laughs> but yeah, thanks, Hannah. I think that's that's really helpful because honestly, external resources is like always nice. And uh, thinking, uh, speaking of three blue, one brown, like we also someone also recommended it in our core eight video for linear algebra. So yeah. I'm sure like it's like a lot of people know it. Mm-hmm. Catherine, do you mind like um, uh, answering answering the question? Like, uh, I heard that you guys had. MATLAB midterm yeah. and I just thought that was like super cool <laughs> yeah. and yeah yeah so essentially we had um a MATLAB lab every week for um the ESC 103 course so we got to learn like the basic syntax of MATLAB and use it to solve a lot of linear algebra problems although I feel like the problems that we solved with MATLAB were more basic so they weren't like hard and complex um, and yeah, we did have a MATLAB midterm at the end that was worth, I think, like 10%, if I remember correctly. Um, and it was just like you were given one problem and you were given, I think, one to two hours to kind of solve the entire problem and plot out the, you know, the correct plots using MATLAB. And I don't know, I personally found that really stressful because like I had no idea like how to do anything in MATLAB. So yeah, I thought that was kind of stressful. But definitely if you like review all the MATLAB labs, I think you can do pretty well because I think the TAs do grade pretty leniently for that. Um, I don't know, Hannah, like what was your experience with the MATLAB? I think for the MATLAB midterm slash final, it, it's, it's basically the same lab as one of the other labs you've done. So the way that I did it was I basically just like review all the past um, materials that I've learned right and then it's like exactly pretty much exactly the same as one of the labs you've done so if you review them well you should be able to do pretty well i heard like a lot of people in the class actually get like 10 out of 10 for example Mm -hmm. um another thing is when you review the materials don't memorize the code memorize um the comments that lead to the code so for example um you would sometimes it's like in Python, you're used to doing for loops, right? So usually what I did was I would take a piece of paper and I would just write out kind of like the comments of the steps that I would do in MATLAB and kind of practice, okay, for this one, like what kind of syntax should you have? But you don't even need to do that now because you can use the help function within MATLAB. So technically you can search up the syntax even though it would take longer. So depending on your comfort level, you can choose what, whichever method you want. Um, and then another thing that is review like the mistakes you make. So I have like this commonly made mistakes sheet where I write down, you know, why do I always use the for loop? Makes my code so much longer. Um, and then in MATLAB, you have like certain matrix multiplication um, syntax that you can do. Um, I would definitely say that I didn't spend that much time just like learning MATLAB in general, just because I thought it wasn't that helpful. Um, and I think, in my opinion, it's like better to learn like the intuition behind it. Um, but then to do well in the course, if you just review it, then it's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. Okay, 
Let's move on to the next course, which is MSE 160, Molecules and Materials. So I heard this is a course that integrates chemistry context with material science, and it's the most theory based with some interesting application to engineering. So I guess um, since it's kind of like chemistry based, do you guys think it was similar to high school chemistry or like just a completely new concept? Um, I think I found that it overlapped with a lot of my chemistry concepts from high school, um, but I took Chem IB, so I'm not sure if that applies to, you know, like, everyone. Um, and yeah, I think it was really interesting to see, like, how it was applied in the engineering context, because I think for a lot of the other courses, like, you don't really see the real-life applications. Like, for calculus, you just kind of, like, you know, differentiate or integrate, and you're not really applying them to the real world. So I think this was like one course where the profs really tried to include how to apply the concepts to the real life. Like we learned that, you know, like for Beats headphones, they chose a material that had a giant chunk of metal in it to make it seem more expensive, although the metal is like completely useless. And I still remember mm -hmm. that because I thought it was like really interesting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mind blow. Um, but yeah, like I think this is like a definitely one of the courses that a lot of my friends and I found easy to do well in if we followed the material because a lot of us had learned it before in high school. Yeah, I, I also agree. So my chemistry background is I'm actually a more chemistry girl than a math girl. So I, I did chem AP, but I also did, so I'm from Vietnam and in Vietnam, I also did the chemistry Olympiad. Um, so it's like, it, it teaches you a lot of concepts in you know, university already. And I think even if you do AP, there are a lot of overlaps. So it's one of the courses that people tend to have lower in the priority list just because every other courses are so much more difficult. But I would definitely say don't slack on don't, don't slack <laughs> on it because I remember there was a time where I just I got like I slack on it because like, oh, then Professor Stanky course. But I slacked on it and then basically there are certain there are nuances that you usually don't realize when you slack on it. So for example, I think the chapter that if people slack on it do the least well in is kind of like the, the crystallization structure and then you have to learn certain you know ter terminology about the crystallization structure um and then i think in engineering people usually say oh this is the most irrelevant course to engineering but i actually uh disagree because the internship after um first year was at princess margaret hospital and then we did some image um so I was on the medical physics team and then we basically did some image processing. And then a lot of the knowledge in image processing actually come from um, chemistry, which is weird because image processing you would think would be more software oriented. And I was like, wow, my knowledge in MSc is actually useful. And I felt so happy because I was like, I have a competitive edge <laughs> as a researcher. So it, it was like, even though it seems so irrelevant, it is interesting. Another advice I would give is for profs who do more sciences-based um, courses. The professor actually had pretty interesting research in nanotech and cancer, but I'm pretty sure 90% of my class would, wouldn't probably know about it. And if you think about it, if you're like, oh, if I want like a research internship in the summer, you know, the professor is so used with getting life sciences people already, and most people in engineering don't know about life sciences. If you are like somebody who's interested, like even a tiny bit, um, like it's easier for you to get in those labs just because the professor is like surprised that you are curious. So that would be like another tip I would give, which is if you want to intern at like chemistry or bio-based or just like life sciences based uh, lab, um, like show genuine curiosity in their in their in the class, and then usually that that is like a big thing um, that could help you over other students and a lot of people say you need like resumes and good, good marks but I think if you establish just like an ongoing relationship with a professor throughout the year then I think it's pretty good you have a pretty good chance in the summer mm -hmm. yeah yeah I guess because um I know a lot of people are interested in the research portion of like engineering we will have another episode on it but I think it's nice to kind of like mention some tips like when because it is important to have good relationships with the profs yeah, and for this course, I just want to ask also another quick question because I heard there's a custom textbook and I was just wondering how well like people use the custom textbook and how it kind of affects the exams. Like were the exams really related to the textbook? Yeah. 
Uh, I think it varies depending on the person. Like my friend did not open his textbook even once, but I used it every day and I like I highlighted all the concepts. So I found it really helpful personally because I'm a pretty textual learner. And I think this is like the textbook is like one of the most organized textbooks because it like exactly aligned with our course because it was custom made by like the two profs. So yeah, I really liked it and I thought it was really helpful, but I don't think it's necessary to succeeding in the course. Like if you're a different type of learner, if you learn by listening in class or just like doing practice problems. Um, yeah, like you don't have to read through all the text in the textbook, but I do think it's like very valuable to do the homework problems in the textbook. Oh, so were the midterms more related to the textbook or the problems that you guys do or? Um, if I remember correctly, I think we were assigned certain problems in the textbook that we had. And I would say those are very close to the midterm and final questions. Okay, yeah. And they also have quizzes as well. And the quizzes essentially mimic the, the problems. But then they also give you a lot of problems. So then you have to be smart about what problems you choose to solve. So sometimes they will give you a problem. Like, I don't know if it's oxidation or drawing the shape of the molecule, whatever. Like, there are those. And then, and then they would have like 20 of those, right? Because like, obviously the professor is not going to Okay, pick out okay let's do this one and not the other ones so essentially what i do is i just like choose the one that looks kind of complicated and then do them um and then usually if you do the complicated one you should be able to do the easier ones and then um you can also apparently there are also answer sheets online um either the professor gives you or you can just find on the internet um and then those have the answers to the easier ones so I would say just like be smart about what problem you choose to solve because they give you a lot and you don't have all the time in the world, especially if you have SIF. Um, so it's like just pick and choose the ones that look hard. Okay. Yeah, that's great tips. Um, I think that honestly applies for most of the courses. There are some courses that you have to do all the questions, but I think like most re like courses, they give you a lot of practice on like the similar topics. The next course group that we're going to talk about, um, we group these together because they're both physics, but I don't know if they're necessarily related, but um, it's uh, Physics 180 Classical Mechanics and EC 159 Fundamental of Electric Circuits. So Physics 180 is all about classical mechanics, which builds off calculus knowledge and integrates that with many different topics, such as dynamics and kinematics, whereas EC 159 is like the only hardware course in first year, and it provides an overview of circuit elements as well as how to do circuit analysis. I guess we can touch on classical mechanics first was this really similar to like your high school physics and how are the labs in these like this course specifically uh so personally like i was in a bio stream in high school so i barely did any physics in high school so i found this course like all the concepts in this course to be brand new but um I do, like, some of my friends did say that the first bit of the course was exactly what they learned in high school, and that's what, like, the first midterm was largely based on, um, but the second half of the course, I would say, are pretty new concepts to most people, unless they did some, like, intense physics courses in high school, um, and I thought that was the part that most people struggled with, because it was really new, and there weren't a lot of, I guess, like, guidance in the textbook as to how to do these problems. Were the labs really similar to like the textbook lectures or? Um, I think I would say that they were kind of not the most related in terms of pace. Like I remember in the labs, we did like the pendulum lab really early, but we didn't really learn about the concept of, um, I forget what the concept was called, but like the concept related to pendulums later on in the course. Um, so, But I still find that doing the labs did help me with doing the final because they're both kind of like time pressure, time sensitive things. And I did find that I had to use a lot of the concepts from the labs in the midterm and the final. But just pace wise, I feel like they're not, you know, on par week by week. So just be aware of that and just keep up with the lecture material. Even if you don't go over in the lab, like don't think that, you know, like this concept is not important because a lot of the concepts on the finals weren't from the labs. So you kind of have to be mindful of I guess, like, keeping up with both the lab material as well as the lecture material. Mm -hmm. So, Hannah, how did you find this course? Like, how would you recommend studying? Because uh, I heard from my friend that 
apparently the lectures were hard to follow, slightly hard to follow because it was more proof based. But the test was like very different from the lectures and was like more similar to your quiz yeah. and homework questions. Yeah. So I will, I will like exactly how I felt when I went to first year. So essentially. I went in thinking that I, I knew how to do free physics, and then I realized that I didn't. So that was like the first real, realization that throws people off, because it's like, physics in high school for me is kind of like like math. It's like, it's like you block and jump for a physical problem as opposed to a mathematical problem. So it was quite easy in high school, but then even in AP. But then basically when I went to first year, it was completely different because what happened was the professor would, you know, just start writing a lot on the board right just like he just start writing he, he stops once in a while to explain but at 90 percent you're probably not going to understand what he's going to explain starts writing a lot and then boom you have a result and you don't know where the result comes from and then because of that i i was like oh my gosh i'm so confused i don't know what's going on but i think um the you need to see through the noise versus the important things so in physics what they do is they start from a very simple facts like F equals MA, second Newton law, and then they start deriving a bunch of stuff from it, um, and then and then they get to the results. So that what that means is that there are two skills you need to practice. One is the derivation skill. So how do you go from a simple fact to like something more fancy? And two, um, like basically learning to see what is the important result from the whole board. Because he may write a lot, but then there may be three lines on the whole board that is important that you need to know about. So one of my causes of failure, I, I guess, in physics was because I, weren't, I wasn't able to see this is more important than that, you know? So that is one of the reasons. So I think given limited time and resources, you should practice the second skill first, which is highlighting the important um, formulas. And then number two, there are problems where derivation is more important than others. So sometimes, um, like I remember there was this problem with like something that physics physics professors do to throw you off is for example they would teach you about the centroid of like a certain shape and then how the physics were with that and the shape is super simple like a square or something and then on an exam they put like two coins and there's like a circle in the middle of another circle and then you're like how the hell do I do that so I think um, noticing like being smart about parts of the problem that the professor would try to do to throw you off is really helpful. So after that exam, I know that, oh, you know, the shape of the things and the physics of that shape um, affects a lot, you know, obviously the, the real physics behind it. But then it's like before that, I was just trying to memorize the formulas because he wrote so many on the board. But I would say memorize the key ones and then think about, okay, what are some generate your own questions and what are some ways that make this problem harder? And one of it is just changing the shape. And then try solving it when the shape is changed and then see what the result is like. Um, the third thing I would say is one way to cut through the noise is that physics often is just a lot of math and then one important physics conclusion. Um, so, so for the math, one of the reasons why my friends were kind of frustrated learning this course was because they didn't understand the math. So I remember in second year, or like in second semester, we learned about second homogeneous uh, differential equations and non-homogeneous second um, differential equations, and then just a bunch of names. So basically in first semester, none of us knew about calculus. We were learning integrals, but then the professor was throwing um, calculus at us that we didn't even know about. And that was one of the sources of confusion and it prevents people from seeing the bigger picture of what is the physics conclusion that they should be fo focusing on. So then my suggestion is when are you, where you find yourself confused, ask yourself what is the important things. And for the math, look online to see if there is like a 10 to 30 minute video, watch it on 2x speed, um, and then, then try to understand the math behind it. It really, really helps in the later classes because the knowledge builds on top of each other. And the math is always the same. He uses the same math all the time. But because you don't know the math, it makes you feel like every class you're lost. But the reality is you're not. You're smart. But then it's just the math is there. You, have, you didn't know it's not your fault. So just learn. When you see like fancy math, uh, which is like usually he uses some differential equation. He uses Taylor expansion. Just go in three blue and brown and then learn it um, once. And then you're 
probably ahead of the game in the other classes if he ever uses that math again. Um, and then in second semester, people finally understood the concept in first semester because they learned the calculus. But imagine if you just learn it in 30 minutes, very low effort in first semester, you would probably do a lot better because um, you don't get confused. So that, that would be my, my advice. Yeah. Um, do you guys want to talk a little bit just on the the circuits course? I would imagine similar to like e- like EC circuits course, like it's probably a lot of solving circuits. And you guys also have the connect questions. So how important was like the connect questions to this course, I guess? Was it more th- was this course more theoretical or just kind of like ours, just doing a bunch of circuits? I think this was one of the only courses where we didn't have to do proofs. We just had to go at it, you know? Yeah, like, I I really like this course. Uh, I think this course was what made me want to go into energy systems. Um, and it was just a very organized course overall. Like, there was a syllabus that told you, like, which exact sections of the textbook you had to read, like, which connect questions you had to do. And by setting deadlines for the connect questions, it kind of helped you keep on track and not fall behind. So yeah, like I really like this course because there were, I would, I want to say zero proofs, but I'm not sure if that's going to be true in future years. But yeah, like my favorite course. (laughs) Yeah, I think the course is like relatively easier than other courses because it's not sporadic. It's very stable, like more and more high school typey kind of course. Like you learn in class, do problem set, and then you automatically do well on tests and exams. So I think it's one of the courses that like are better in that way so if you're someone who's like just hardworking and good then it's like I think you're you're gonna be chilling um in this course (laughs) that's great that's good to know at least there's some some sort of bird courses I'm sure it's not (laughs) that that birdie like I'm sure it's still hard but like that's good to know for end size um next course we're going to move on to is um the civ course so the civ 102 structures and materials Civ 102 teaches the fundamentals of designing structures, so it provides a wide breadth of knowledge in structural properties of engineering materials and basic structural elements. So this is actually, I'd say, a pretty famous course in some sense. Like, I think these are, this is one of the courses that even, like, everyone in engineering has heard about, and you guys do some pretty interesting projects, and it looks pretty intense. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, do you guys want to talk a little bit about I guess, how to make this course easier or more helpful? Yeah, this course is definitely pretty intensive in terms of workload. Like, we have weekly problem sets. We had two major projects and a lot of, like, extra office hours apart from the tutorials. So it was a lot of work. But, um, yeah, I think one way that really helped me, I guess, like, manage all the information, because you do get a lot since it's kind of like a crash course on civil engineering, Um one way that I found to make the information more manageable was to organize the notes um, in the custom textbook that we had to buy from um, Professor Collins. Um, so I had like a table of contents in the beginning that was able to kind of summarize where everything, where all the concepts were. And but because you can take that custom notebook into the final, it was really important like time-wise for the final to organize everything in that notebook and not just have like a bunch of clutter from your notes so I had like I summarized the important equations from every lecture into like one of like a tiny box at the end of each lecture and like highlighted it and I thought that was really helpful especially during the final when you had to find the right formulas really quickly so that really helped me personally Um, and in terms of like doing problems I thought that like the problem sets were pretty difficult and I do think that they were like a bit harder than what you would expect on the final. So it's important to do well on them. And if you, I think if you can like do well on those and demonstrate critical thinking, then you should be fine for the final. And I think, you know, the course pretty well prepares you for what's coming in the final. Yeah, I heard, I heard that your head TA was very helpful. Mm -hmm, Yeah, (laughs) Al, he's very nice. Yeah, Yeah. that's good. Um, Hannah, do you want to speak like briefly about the two big projects? So we, uh, there was a bridge project, and then what's the other one? Uh, it, I, uh, I think there's a bridge, pro- uh, there's a truss bridge design, and like map board bridge project. Oh yeah, okay. I, so is it the same thing? I it's pretty much the same. <laughs> oh, maybe it's different. One is like a poster, and then the other one is the actual bridge. Yeah. So I think, um, 
I think the trust bridge project isn't that difficult. You just need to be good at researching information and like be thoughtful about like the design. Like why do you choose certain features of the design? And Professor Collins would just like look at it. And then he's he's such like a father figure too. So he would just like, oh yeah, I like it. He goes to everyone and he says, I like it. I don't know if he actually means it because <laughs> the man has seen probably thousands of bridges before. Um, but yeah, he, he's a very kind. I think that project is easier to ace on. The other project is, um, um, basically, the other bridge project is basically you have to build a mad board bridge based on certain parameters. So here's the hack. So basically, sometimes people draw, draw the parameters out, da, da, da. but there are a lot of um, upper year inside students that they created a genetic algorithm um, that takes in certain parameters and it auto generates like a bridge for you. So it's like, so they did that and then people did it multiple years as well. So you should definitely go on github and look up those projects to at least see the guidance of how they did it how they think about how they thought through it i didn't know this in first year and then after i realized that a bunch of my friends did it i was like oh briefest years also did it so a lot of upper years who um like design algorithms to generate bridges don't don't use it without their permission of course but i think the the merit of these resources is that they already outlined their thinking for you so for example why did i choose this structure versus another structure and it really saves time because i think the the time loss in this process is usually the ambiguity that you don't know what you're doing because it's the first time ever designing like a wholly like full structure so if you know what good looks like like what you know a hundred looks like by looking at these github uh, repos over many years and you know compare them then you have a better picture of what you should do and i think that's one of the shortcomings of um design courses and things in general is that they don't give you what a hundred percent looks like so they don't give you this is what great looks like um it's like for example when you want to design something in software you can go on triple.com see some fancy designs go on facebook stripe you know these different softwares and you know oh these are the, how the best engineers in the world are doing it in software but there are no resources that tell you these are the best how the best civil engineers do in the world when they want to design bridges so because of that it's hard for you as a noob to be able to perform well so to set yourself up for success definitely check out the githubs um and then you you'll find a lot of stuff up there and then essentially kind of like model your uh project after that um and then essentially also your tas also give you resources as well on what kind of mm -hmm. math that you need to do in order to justify your design decisions um just curious like do you guys choose your own groups or was it like assigned groups it was it was assigned yeah, it was assigned but i think the tas basically just like assigned you with people that you sat with in tutorial all the time <laughs> yeah the that's, tas that's, for that's this course are so nice like they cover like they summarize lectures for you and like i don't know they're just like the nicest people <laughs> mm -hmm. i heard that um doing like the po when doing the past exams and quizzes for this course like you have to really watch out for like the speed like you want to do it fast or something it's like a general tip or just like is it specific for this course um i think for the simple question like there are like staple questions that i feel like are on the final every year so i feel like for those questions like it would help you to kind of do those faster because they're pretty systematic like you analyze it just like trust by trust um and yeah they're very systematic you just have to go fast and that helps you save time for the more difficult questions that vary between year to year and it gives you more time to think about those so i think that's pretty helpful mm -hmm. also look at the past exams that span across like until like 2010 even um and i would suggest do like maybe half of the exams do the later ones and how do you have and probably divide among your friends um to do all the exams until 2010 because i remember it was this one really difficult question on professor collins final exam and it was from the exact same question from 2012 and nobody really did the 2012 exams people did three years um in the to the past so i would say that's like a smart way to do it which is instead of doing the easy questions on every exam look at like the unique problems across 10 years and then do them first and then go back to the easy questions mm -hmm. okay cool so now we're gonna move on to the, na the last course set which is ESC 101, ESC 102, the practice one and two courses. Two practice courses are the two first year design courses that are focused on group work, 
They teach you tools of engineering design and give you the opportunity to apply engineering design process to a real life problem. So this is actually, I guess, the course that was most asked among like first years when we did our survey. Like they're all like curious, like how this course works, like how like time consuming was this course, how intense was this course and how I guess helpful was this course. So if you guys want to like give like a just like a brief breakdown of this course, that would be great. Sure. Um, yeah, Praxis One basically introduces you to some of the basic engineering design concepts, like what are stakeholders, what are metrics, um, and you know that kind of thing. And you get to apply these concepts to an engineering problem within campus. So in our year, the problem was how would you um, how would you design something that's able to help students that commute to campus? And that was um, a problem that was um, where you got to apply all the concepts you learned. Um, and Praxis 2 is kind of like a continuation of that. So it builds off the basic concepts in Praxis 1. And the project for Praxis 2 is more, I guess, like integrated with society because I guess like, you know, the professors trust you more to like represent U of T in the greater, I guess, like GTA community. And you got to go find a problem on your own or with your group based on, you know, like what your interests are and everything. So yeah, I definitely say for both courses, like they're more... Um, yeah, they're very focused on engineering design and it's not an overly technical course, which is nice. And you got to work in groups as opposed to just like studying by yourself for other courses. Were the groups assigned for this one as well? Yeah. So I think, um, the professors have like an algorithm or something to, they give you like work style personality test kind of things. And then they pair you up based on that, which I thought was interesting. Like, I feel like it works or at least it worked for me because like all my groups were pretty nice but um yeah like I guess like everyone had different experiences with it Mm -hmm. yeah this is also a very I guess famous course among like the course like we've all heard about this course like all the ench size that we know have like practice on their like website Mm -hmm. or something and it was like pretty pretty interesting I think this is like one of the few courses that kind of applies regardless like what discipline of engineering you go into like a lot of my friends on PEY they told me about how their internship um, revolves around you know like being able to come up with metrics and objectives for what you're doing regardless if they're like an ECE or chem or mech so I think that's what's helpful about this course. Another tip I would give is for example when you get to choose your own problem uh, something I would have done differently is actually choose a problem that you like are excited to work on um, and can be put in your portfolio because usually when you bring you know like as an engineering a lot of people bring resume but usually I bring portfolio that demonstrates the projects I did it's kind of like it's like a pdf and it's like oh these are the projects I did and then like make it look professional as if you're an architect but then it's like oh for engineering um it does help you stand out but usually your project needs to be at least like to some degree meaningful so for example I remember one of the groups that did pretty well um they were basically about notes organization and then basically it was like um like a mechanism for you to take notes better in physics 180 because it, it, it was really really fast paced and they did well because they you know they had some ux ui design in there and then they can demonstrate it to their future employees you know whereas for me my group did something i don't remember what we did like umbrella like some sort of umbrella for rain or something like that like that problem has been solved already right it's it's not like a an unsolved problem and because of that it's not interesting to the ta so then and it's not interesting to your future employer so when you choose the problem in practice don't choose it because it's easy just choose something that is interesting and usually people gravitate towards interesting problems anyways even though your solution may not be well crafted but because the problem itself is interesting they give you more leeway in terms of not having a perfect solution as opposed to if you choose an easy problem that has already been solved the bar is super high um and then since you're first year you're not going to reach the high bar anyways so choose a hard problem it's like the counterintuitive advice yeah yeah, yeah. i think yeah. i guess for this sorry go first. uh i would just have a question for this course like is since it's so design based did you has have any like midterms or finals on it or is it like presentations like were you guys highly graded on more presentations or like your writing like project reports 
I would say it's kind of split half and half between presentations and writing reports, or at least like that's what I remember most from this course, and I think that's what most of my time for this course went towards. Um, studying for the concepts, I feel like you kind of need to do that in order to do well on the report because you need to do you need to use more like praxisy language for the report to do well. I think um, in terms of like the midterm. Uh, I don't believe we had a midterm in Praxis 2, but we did have one in Praxis 1, but I don't think it counted for marks in our year because there were some like technical difficulties. Um, the final, I can't remember if we had a final. Hannah, do you remember? We, we did have a final and it was spare Praxis. Like it, they basically want you to use like Praxis terms, so they would literally count. So they have this system on their document. And then basically whenever you use a Praxis term, like you can, you know, autocomplete basically. <laughs> Um, and then you can like press tab and it auto completes for you and then you know it's like a process term so like the key to that is like trying to understand the definition like the prescribed definition that the professor gives you and then apply it um, in like the exam and I feel like the more words you use the better because then it's like oh you know a lot of concepts yeah mm-hmm. and I find like for finals especially or for the final especially like okay. I don't remember doing it but um, I do remember like trying to integrate all the concepts together because sometimes like when the prof teaches them to you they're kind of like in separate lectures so you don't think of them as one unit but if you're able to integrate different concepts into one I guess like real life context that they give you I think generally like they really like that because it shows that you actually understand it you're not like regurgitating words yeah I guess this is this is a pretty interesting course like it's just really cool to see you guys like mark out your thought process and like show your design Mm -hmm. i don't know i i think this is very interesting but yeah um we're slightly over time so i think we want to wrap this up so we're just gonna end up uh, end with asking you guys like a very typical question i have one question yeah so like Mm -hmm. i think one of the worries that people going into Mm nsi have is that like there you learn a lot of theories and Mm -hmm. like you don't end up applying them in Mm -hmm. practice when you go into industry would you agree with that statement or um i think personally like you can go both ways with this like i don't know like personally i'm tr- i'm planning to go into industry so i feel like you know i'm not being disadvantaged by learning all like the proofs and everything i think it's actually helping me learn and i think it helps me get a deeper understanding of the concept so i don't think it's like disadvantaging us in any way um but yeah like a lot of the proofs i would say are pretty intense and I don't know like personally like maybe I don't like I don't enjoy learning about them but I do think they help your understanding regardless of if you need them in the future yeah I think it does help for me I think because um, I guess it depends on the types of jobs that you apply to as well so maybe software engineering like it would inside would probably not not be useful for you like a lot of it like physics and stuff um but for but in, i've heard from people like who work at like google research and stuff like that that i met this guy and then he basically he's a researcher and then four out of five of his students in ai is inside students and no matter what stream they went through they, because they didn't have uh, machine intelligence back then um, but then he really liked inside students and inside does have a good reputation when it comes to research in grad school and also with other you know researchers at corporations um another thing i would highlight is you don't know like what kind of knowledge will be useful to you so for example i used to think that you know the mse course wouldn't be useful because it's like oh i i probably wouldn't do chemistry heavy research ever but then i was working in a hospital and it, it was half clinical half research um, and if your research goes well it can be applied to real patients and i was like oh yeah never never gonna use msc courses but then it turned out to be pretty useful and then i think another thing is um, it helps with your way of thinking so in Inksai, they teach you kind of like they try to teach you uh, first principles thinking and that's the reason why they teach you so many proofs because they want you to be able to you know on the fly say that hey this is like the way we do things um and i think one example of that is for example like elon musk when he finished his company at paypal he went out to start a rocket company without having any experience at all about rockets and then the way he was able to do it was because he was like oh wait why do we need to use this theory for rockets like if we just use this 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 and the, the total of the rocket would be a couple thousand dollars as opposed to millions of dollars and that's the premise for spacex so i think that 
anxiety try to Im- uh, instill that mindset in you which is for example when you see a design you don't accept it for it for what it is but rather you ask yourself what are the fundament- fundamental components that you can use to craft a, a solution which is a combination of practices and be, to be able to do that you need a breadth of knowledge so that's the ultimate philosophy of anxiety which is for you to be able to be kind of like a generalist slash specialist that is able to just craft concept really really quickly and be able to come up with solutions on the fly um but if you are someone who because i debated a lot between going into genome biology versus going to biomedical engineering in, in the side and one of the reasons why I decided to just have two years of non-biology is because um, I wanted to be able to have that ability to just um, craft solutions and understand things deeply. So it's like it's more of a skill that they try to teach you as opposed to the knowledge itself. And whether the knowledge applies, it's like it's kind of like, oh, like, I don't know. It's like depending on what you want to do, really. Um, but in research, it mm-hmm. would definitely help. To yeah. have all the knowledge. I guess I also like want to briefly mention here that I know a lot of I actually have a lot of friends that were in EngSci like first year and then they switch out of EngSci because they just realize mm. that that's not what they're into and I guess yeah I guess I think we all agree that that is something that happens quite common and it's like okay if you feel that way mm. right because like, everyone feels differently about these courses yeah yeah, totally. I, I would say that is like a very, very normal thing. It's like, for example, say that you want to be a f- like some people, they want to be like a fish and a dragon and a monkey at the same time. You know, it's like I want to be able to do different things. But some people just want to be a fish, you know, so it's like and it's completely fine to be to specialize being good at a fish as opposed to be like 70 percent good at three different things. So it's a very, very, very valid thing. Yeah, amazing. So do you guys have like one last I guess general tip for either like mental health mm-hmm. or like course like how how to do well in these courses like just like a general like last tip for the first years um i think one tip i would give is to be flexible in your study schedule and like your study routine um when i was coming into first year like i had this like preset schedule from high school and i was sticking to it no matter what but I found that, you know, the results for that weren't necessarily good. So in second semester, I was able to change up my technique depending on the course. And I was able to, you know, like do more practice problems as opposed to just reading the textbook. And I found that, you know, being flexible with your study schedule and your study routine and your techniques helped, or at least it helped me with succeeding in some of the courses. Yeah. I think the last tip for me is probably take care of your mental health and by like to do that you should create a group of friends that vibe that vibe with you well and are able to support you. I'm very lucky to have found Catherine this year and she's an amazing friend. <laughs> but I didn't have like a lot of friends within in first year to be completely honest. And I think that affected my mental health a lot and also affected my performance at school um, because you felt like lonely and it's like a very common thing like many of my best friends now in Inkside didn't was in that situation in first year and I've heard from many friends in second year that their mental health improved and then that improves their you know results as well so I would say that the meta learning is just make sure that you're sane and like not stress out too much um because like 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 nobody's even look at my first year marks anymore you know like it's not that big of a deal even if you go to med school or whatever they look at your third and fourth year marks um and i would say another thing is like invest in unique experiences so i I had this reflection period after the first two years and i was like oh wow i studied so hard but i didn't have a lot of experiences and that could be you know going to the cottage with your friends um that could be you know you know getting the like, go getting together for a camp and like you know just these normal experiences um that people would have just like don't work too hard you know chill a bit have fun go get these unique experiences because it would be what like for example like one day you're sad right you're not going to remember professor stench being <laughs> unfortunately (laughs) like you're gonna remember these experiences with your friends and i think if you don't have those then it will make you more sad so i think like being able to have friends like like proactively do it because it just it doesn't happen like naturally you have to be proactive and the reason i became friends with catherine was because i randomly sat next to lucy which is catherine's friend and i was like hey what's up (laughs) you know so proactively find friends um make your keep your mental health good and then invest in unique experiences that don't have direct 
impact on your current self that it will have uh, like a long-term impact on in your future self i think that would be that would be great like i feel like if i did that in first year my life now would be like i have a good life but it will be even better <laughs> yeah i think yeah that's very solid advice like even though this entire episode we were focusing on academics yeah. which is really important but yeah it's it's also really good to focus on your general experience and thank you guys so much for being here today like um i heard some very solid advice even though i was i'm not an <laughs> nsi but i'm sure that it's very it's very concrete the advice you guys give and just thank you guys so much for being here with us today thank you yeah thank no you problem. for having us well, that's it for today's episode of First Year Decoded. Thanks for listening, and thank you once again to Hannah and Catherine for joining me today. Remember to tune in next week for tips on online study, time stress management, and mental health. This podcast is hosted by Ashable UFT, content creation done by Akinora Kimura, Brandy Chow, Hamanis Chindo, Hao Chin Zhang, and Catherine Liu. Music created by Sujay Kumar, audio edited by Akinori Kimura, and graphics done by Kathy Zhang. Special thanks to Catherine Leung and Hannah Lev for being on the show with us today. Shout out to Avnish Karabasi and Shiki Q helping us out with content creation. Remember to follow us on our social media at UFT to get more information and updates about future events and more content. Once again, thanks for listening to First Year Decoded. We will see you on the next episode.